Thank you very much for that kind introduction and good morning, everyone. I realize as I was putting this talk together that it this year marks the 40th year I will have been dealing with lysosomal storage diseases. So uh, not to tell you how old I am, but you can figure it out. So today I would like to talk about GM1 ganglicidosis and give you just a little snapshot before you hear from patients and families about this important disorder. Lysosomal storage disorders, of which GM1 is a part, are multi-system and collectively common disorders, and many, many of them involve the brain. Individually, GM1 is about one in 100,000 to 200,000 live births, but collectively, lysosomal storage disorders are about one in 5,000 births, so they're actually quite common. And about 70% of them involve the brain, as you can see here on, on this illustration. So let's talk about lysosomal storage disorders, what they are, what is a ganglioside, and what is GM1 ganglioidosis. When I began giving talks about LSDs, I used to always say the lysosome is the cell's recycling center. So if you can imagine the circle is the lysosome and there are various bins that you can throw your trash, your garbage, your paper, your plastic, and what happens in lysosomal storage disorders is one of the bins, one of the baskets gets full. And when that happens, the glass, for example, illustrated here begins to collect. And sooner over time, the glass piles up and piles up and suddenly you have a whole lysosome filled or a whole recycling center here filled with glass. Well, once all the pileup happens, it's impossible not only to recycle glass, but also paper and plastic and garbage. And over time, this lysosome really becomes non-functional. That was kind of our old understanding. Now we know that lysosomes are really the center of the cellular universe. Not only are they responsible for recycling, which is what we'd be talking about today, but as you can see here in the green square, they're also very important for nutrient sensing and the control of energy metabolism in the whole cell. So that an impairment of lysosomal function really impairs the whole cell. And it makes sense why the disorders we're talking about today are um, so life limiting. Um, what I've placed up here in the top is sort of a, schematic of the lysosomal membrane. And I'm gonna use that to kind of try to make sense out of lysosomes, ganglicides, and GM1 ganglicidosis. So here you see the lysosomal membrane. It is a collection of lipids, these green things, which are, I, I say here are oil, which are really um, fatty, greasy substances. And these little head groups, which are more water loving or soluble in water. And inside the plasma membrane are these structures we call lipid rafts. These are these float uh, throughout the plasma membranes and they contain very important things. They contain proteins, they contain these transmembrane proteins, they contain cholesterol, and they also contain gangliosides, particularly in the neurons where the gangliosides are really predominant in the neurons. So these lipid rafts, are components of cell membranes, and they're enriched, as I said, in cholesterol, glycosphingolipid, and receptor proteins, and they're really essential in cellular processing, including cell-cell signaling, for which one can imagine the neuron is very important. And gangliosides are constituents of these lipid rafts. So what is a gangliocide? If you take these gangliocide structures, let me go back for a minute, here that are called gangliocide, and you flip them 90 degrees to the left, you see the schematic that I've drawn here. There is a head part, a water loving part. These are sugars, they're soluble in water. And then there is this fatty piece that goes down into the membrane. It's called ceramide and they are hydrophobic or phobic water hating molecules. Okay, so that's a gangliocide, but what is GM1 gangliosidosis? And really the name tells you exactly what it is. It's GM1 gangliocide, 
And osis in medical terms is usually a disease state that results in abnormal production or an increase in whatever it is we're talking about. So in this situation, this is an increase or an overabundance of GM1 ganglioside. And in this case, not because it is overproduced, it's because it is not broken down and accumulates in the cell. So GM1 ganglioidosis is a disorder of ganglioside degradation. It's caused by mutations in a gene called GLB1. And GLB1 produces an enzyme called beta galactosidase. And so another name for GM1 ganglioidosis is beta galactosidase enzyme deficiency. So as we saw in some previous slides, it is the inability to cut off this first sugar from GM1 ganglioside. Unfortunately, if you can't cut off the end or the terminal sugar, you can't break down the molecule any farther. And that's why GM1 is stored in, in lysosomes. This is a rare neurodegenerative disorder that is uniformly fatal. And unfortunately right now has no approved therapies. It is pan-ethnic. That means it occurs all over the world. And it has an incidence, as I mentioned, of about one in 200,000 live births. So let's go back to our schematic, lysosomes, the center of the cellular universe. Beta-galactosidase enzyme resides in the lysosome. This is a rather acidic environment. And in fact, beta-galactosidase, the lysosomal beta-galactosidase, it doesn't even work unless it's within the lysosome. And inside the lysosome, in addition to beta-galactosidase, are 40 or 50 other lysosomal enzymes that are responsible for similar things, breaking sugars down off ganglicides and other uh, sphingolipids. So what happens, as I explained to you, and this schematic will show you probably better, GM and ganglioside can be cleaved to remove the terminal galactose. And that happens if you have beta-galactosidase in the lysosome. The schematic here shows you that off the membrane, pieces are taken back into the cell for recycling, for degrading GM1 and allowing it to reform into other constituents. They traverse into the late endosome and they finally make their way to the lysosome where beta-galactosidase breaks them down. However, if that is not possible because there is no beta-galactosidase, the lysosome begins to accumulate and accumulate more and more and more GM1. And eventually it accumulates so much that the lysosome becomes non-functional. It can't do the jobs, the other jobs it's supposed to do like nutrient sensing and energy metabolism. And the whole cell suffers and eventually, unfortunately, the whole cell dies. And in the case of neurons, when neurons die, they are not replaced. So the result, are the symptoms that we see in GM1 ganglioidosis. So GM1 is really a continuum, which means that disease severity is directly related to the amount of residual enzyme activity one has left. So there are many, many mutations in the GLB1 gene that will produce beta-galactosidase deficiency. Some are more severe deficiencies than others, if you have essentially no beta-galactosidase activity, that is the most severe disease. If you have a little bit of residual function, say up to five or 10%, you can have a more mitigated disease. So we describe these in three different types. Type one is the infantile disease with onset very early, before six months. Low muscle tone, developmental arrest, enlarged liver and spleen, and a characteristic finding in an eye exam called a cherry red macula. Patients also develop seizures, they become blind, they have skeletal changes, and they generally die by about two to three years of age. Type two, or what we sometimes call type two A, is the late infantile onset form, which begins at about 12 to 24 months, often with impaired emulation. What I mean by that is difficulty learning to walk well or increase falling. They also have lack of or regression of speech. These are children that usually develop single words. Sometimes they begin to put them together into two or three word phrases, but then they lose the ability to do that. Decreased cognition. Some have skeletal disease, others do not. 
Eventually they de develop seizures and death usually ensues in the mid teens. The type 2B or juvenile disease has an onset between ages three and six. Um, they also have impaired ambulation. Now, generally these are children who learn to walk and run and then will begin to fall and trip and have an unsteady gait. They also have progressive, what often parents describe as stuttering or difficulty understanding the speech. They have decreased cognition over time and variable skeletal disease. Some have severe skeletal disease, some do not. And these children I say survive at least into the fourth decade because two of my oldest patients are now in their early thirties. And lastly, there's the type three or adult onset disorder, which is very uncommon in this country. And this features gait disturbance, dystonia, dysarthria or impaired speech, decreased cognition, and quite a variable range in age at which uh, patients die. So I think this schematic tells us um, about sort of the spectrum of disease in GM1. The most severe disease, the infantile disease, is much more homogeneous in infantile patients, and the less severe, more heterogeneous juvenile onset disease really has onset at varying times and spreads over a much wider range for phenotype, and the late infantiles fall somewhere in the middle. This heterogeneity in disease onset and in disease progression makes demonstrating improvement with a therapy, for example, over a short period of time exceedingly difficult for these type two late infantile and juvenile onset patients without extending a clinical trial for years and years. It just makes doing clinical trials quite difficult in these children. GM1 ganglion acidosis is what we call an autosomal recessive disorder. This implies that the mother and father are both carriers for a mutation in GLB1. One copy of their GLB1 gene has a mutation, the other one does not. They are perfectly healthy. But when we go to have our kids, we only can pass one copy of each gene, as you can see illustrated here. One chance in four. Both parents pass the copy that does not work well and the child will have GM1 ganglicidosis. So the chance for having an affected offspring from two carrier parents is 25% or one chance in four for each pregnancy. Healthy offspring, these three, you can see here and two thirds of them will be carriers of the disease. Reproductive options are quite limited without early diagnosis. And I will explain that in the next slide. Diagnosis is taking much too long. This is my cohort of patients at the NIH. We have 41 patients. 30 of them are probands or the index cases. The others are siblings. We have 17 late infantile patients and 24 juvenile patients. But the median time to diagnosis for our late infantile patients was 17 and a half months after the onset of symptoms. And truly, the median time to diagnosis in our juvenile patients was 10 years after the onset of their symptoms. That is way too long to begin to think about therapy. There are many mutations in our cohort of 41 patients. There are 36 different mutations. The presenting symptoms, as I've discussed before, are really gait disturbance and poor speech or stuttering. And early diagnosis including newborn screening is really, really key for successful treatment. I cannot emphasize that enough. It is difficult to think about how we treat these patients if in fact they've really had symptoms of their disease for months to years before we can even intervene. So now I would invite you to sit back and listen to the families begin to tell their stories much more eloquently than I could ever do. It's back to you.